Hi, I'm Marilyn Cargill, Vice President for Financial Aid Services at DSAC, and I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation, How to Appeal Your Financial Aid. And I want to apologize that we're having a little bit of technical difficulty, but I think we're straightened out now. So what we would like to do today is let you talk with two experts who have been doing financial aid for well over 30 years between the two of them. And what they're gonna talk about tonight is when you should appeal financial aid and what steps you need to take in order to appeal your financial aid package. And we're gonna do this tonight by looking at three real life scenarios that some of you may be facing. One of the best reasons to join a live webinar is so you can ask questions of the experts. To raise questions today from the Zoom presentation, you can type your question right into the Q&A section. If you're watching from the Facebook platform, just type your question in the comments. And then we're also planning to have time at the end of the presentation for any additional comments that might and questions that might come up. So what I'd like to do is get us started by introducing today's presenters. Miranda Roth works in the Grant and Scholarship Department for VSAC, where she has been helping Vermont families pay for college for over 22 years. Miranda is also the mom of a college student so she has experience both professionally and personally in what many of you are going through right now. And Miranda is a St. Mike's alum, so she is very familiar with our Vermont schools. Miranda is going to be our expert on how to appeal your Vermont state grant. Our second presenter tonight is Zach Goodwin. Zach serves as the Senior Director of Student Financial Services at St. Michael's College and is the current president of the Vermont Association of Financial Aid Administrators. Higher education in Vermont is deeply important to him, having also worked at Middlebury College and a graduate from Bennington College. Zach is clearly the expert when it comes to how schools handle appeals. Zach and Miranda, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you. So let's start with what is a financial aid appeal? What are we talking about? An appeal is a request to have your financial aid reconsidered based on a change in your family's financial situation from the information you provided on your FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Many of you probably filed your financial aid forms this winter, maybe even last fall, possibly before COVID-19 pandemic was even on anybody's radar screen. And perhaps even more importantly, the income that was required on those financial aid forms was your 2018 income, which may look really different from what you are currently experiencing. So in order to account for those changes that can occur, there is an opportunity to appeal financial aid. The good news is that if your financial picture is not as strong as it was in 2018, or if something changed for the worst since you filed the FAFSA, you can ask for your aid to be reconsidered. One important note is that today we are talking about financial aid, not merit aid, and there is a distinction. Financial aid is based on the financial situation that your family is in, and your family could be parents and a dependent student, or it could be self-supporting adult student, whatever your family situation is. Merit aid is the aid you might have received from your school based on your grades, your athleticism, musical ability, or some other outstanding feature that you bring to that college or university. And that usually is not impacted by appealing your financial aid. So Miranda, let's start with you tonight. When students and parents ask you, why should I appeal? What do you tell them? What are, what What's the best reasons for appealing financial aid? Great question, Marilyn. Uh, so you should appeal your financial aid if your financial situation has changed since you completed the financial aid applications for the year. Or as you mentioned, you feel the information provided on the financial aid applications does not accurately represent your current financial situation. So when you apply for financial aid, you complete the FAFSA, the Vermont grant application, and possibly college financial aid applications. And as you mentioned, when completing the FAFSA for the upcoming school year, the income information requested is from 2018. 
the family size information is what you expected your family size to be through the end of the school year, so through next June 2021. And the asset information is as of when you filled out the application. So if you filled out any financial aid applications, you know they ask for a lot of information, but it's pretty specific and it's for a pretty specific time frame. And there's not a lot, if any, room for explanation of special circumstance. So if you've had a change in situation or there's something related to your income in 2018, maybe it was a little higher than it normally is, or you had some expenses that aren't reflected on the financial aid applications, you should appeal and talk to your financial aid office or offices and visa. Okay, Miranda, thank you so much for that. So Zach, when is the right time to appeal? Are there time limits that families need to understand? Can you run out of um, like runway to get your appeal in? Like, is do they need to worry about that? <laughs> well, Marilyn, I think the, it's a very important question. And generally, I would say that the best time to begin the appeal process is when you simply become aware that something has changed. So if we're thinking about the COVID-19 situation, for example, uh, let's say someone, a parent perhaps was laid off or furloughed from their job for a long period of time, when you know that something like that has happened, absolutely, you should go ahead and reach out to your financial aid office to see what your next steps are. Um, certainly some things to consider are that you're gonna hear this a lot today, everyone who's attending, that different schools will handle things different ways, but that's why as soon as you know that something has changed, uh, that's a good time to contact them to find out what they're going to need from you, what sort of documentation they might like, what information they want you to have on hand because sometimes when those things happen you don't really know what that's going to mean for a little while so different schools may want different kinds of information from you and we'll look at different time frames. Zach if you don't mind I would also like to add that the Vermont legislature this year is incredibly mm -hmm. concerned that due to the pandemic Vermont families are facing real challenges when it comes to paying for college and they're really concerned that there's going to be students who end up making the decision not to go to school because financially they're not sure they can do it. They have actually given VSAC a very large pool of money to help in that exact circumstance. So there is never a better time to appeal financial aid than right now. And I would encourage any family that thinks their financial circumstance is different especially if it's related to COVID-19, to reach out to VSAC and reach out to their school. So Miranda, at the highest level, can you just talk us through what do families need to do to appeal their financial aid? Sure, so we'll go into a little more detail as we talk about each of the sample special circumstances that we're, we're going to talk about in a little bit. But in general, you will appeal your federal and college financial aid through your college financial aid office or offices if you're still in the college decision-making process. And you'll, you will appeal the Vermont grant through VSAC. And as Zach mentioned, all of us will have different requirements on what can be appealed, what you will need to do to appeal, and what documentation may be required. So it's really important to talk with all of us. That's also going to be a theme tonight is communicate with all of us. Um, so the best place to start is with a call or an email to your financial aid office and to VSAC to discuss your situation. Let us know what has changed or what your special circumstances are and ask if it's something that we might be able to take into consideration when re-evaluating your financial aid or your Vermont grant eligibility. And do know that although we may be able to take into consideration your circumstance, the change, depending on what it was, may not be enough to impact your financial aid eligibility. But just like we don't know what your financial situation is except for what you reported on your financial aid forms, you won't know if we can take into consideration your circumstances unless you ask. So just ask us a lot of questions. So Miranda, it sounds like the two important takeaways here are we can't know what the family circumstance is unless they tell us. And if they're talking to either the school or VSAC, they need to talk to both. Correct. That's so schools it. don't send information automatically to VSAC or vice versa. The, the family has to decide who they'd like to appeal to. That's right. Perfect. Okay. 
So I'd like to present the two of you with some samples of appeals and then let you just talk through with us what would happen on a college campus and what would happen at VSAC. Is that gonna work for you guys? Sounds good. Okay, so the first one has to do with a change in income. Marsha and her husband are self-employed and have owned a food cart since 2014 where they sell handmade sandwiches, salads, and beverages. They run their food cart in the spring, summer, and fall outdoors and at the indoor farmer's market in the winter. In 2018, they had a really great year and finally felt like they had turned a financial corner. This year, however, although they are still working, they have seen their income fall in large part due to COVID-19. They simply aren't seeing any foot traffic where their food cart is located. They want to know, even though they are both working, so they haven't lost their jobs, can they still appeal? I'll start with that one. So yes, for the Vermont grant, um, because they have had a change in income from 2018 to 2020, it's that reduction in income that we can consider as a special circumstance. And because of the impact of COVID-19, we actually expect a lot more appeals related to something like this, either job loss completely or layoffs or just a reduction in income. Um, so, um, but you, it doesn't just have to be related to, to COVID. It could, the change could have happened for something completely separate. If your income has changed since 2018, you can appeal with us. And the way that you would do that with BSAC is we will have you or the parents complete an estimated income worksheet. And that worksheet is available online. We'll post it through the student's My VSAC account. And that worksheet is used to document 2020 income. Once we receive that worksheet, we'll use it to determine the student's grant eligibility. And we will let the student know if it changes any thing, if it changes the Vermont grant, or if it doesn't, we'll let you know either way. In the past, students who appealed successfully to use estimated income, last year they saw their grants increase on average $3,000. So it's worth um, having, you know, asking that question. Zach, I'd love to have you answer this, but I'm going to throw a question from the audience in um, that I think fits right into this conversation. Should the email or call come from the student? Or is it appropriate for a parent to make that call? I, I have a very special answer to that one, Marilyn. <laughs> um, ultimately, uh, of course, it's the student's application. And I think many people are especially impressed or receptive to a student actually taking the time to go through the process, gather the needed information and submit it and be the person of taking ownership of the appeal. Um, but by the same token, of course, generally what we're dealing with, at least at the undergraduate level, is a person and their parents. The parents are very responsible for payment and helping support the student. So there's certainly nothing wrong with that coming from the parent. And sometimes documents have to be coming from the parents. Perfect. And did you want to add anything else about estimated income to what Miranda said? Like, what would happen on a college campus? It's not the VSAC estimated income worksheet they must need to fill out. Correct. Uh, you will all get tired of hearing this answer, but of course, every school that you are in communication with may ask for something different. Um, at my own institution, we use a worksheet that's very similar to VSAC's to ask for information about projected 2020 income. Uh, but there are some institutions that are not as comfortable with using projected amounts and would prefer to use something more definitive. So they might ask you about what happened in 2019, for example. Uh, some schools may allow for projection to an extent, but might want to check in with you partway through the year to see where you actually ended up since we're projecting. Gives them a chance to see what the final actual figures look like. So one more question before I move on that I think fits in really well. Um, this question reads, hi, can I appeal financial aid for my room and board? So is, is it appeal only about your tuition costs or is it about the entire cost of going to school? And Zach, do you want to start with that one? Sure. 
Uh, happy to. Uh, really, it could be applicable to any aspect of the student's cost. Uh, different schools, of course, will be a little different in terms of what their own institutional dollars can count toward, but certainly when we're dealing with federal financial aid, that type of aid can cover any kind of cost that you're incurring for your education, whether that's tuition, room and board, your books and supplies, transportation costs, all of those kinds of things. So it's, it's the entire financial cost of the institution that you're appealing. What you can afford to pay towards that. That's really what this is all about. Okay, great. There's a few more questions that have come in and I'm gonna hold them for a minute um, until we get through these examples and I'm gonna circle back to them. So Zach, our second example has to do with medical expenses. And can you take a few minutes and just explain to us what type of expenses can be considered, who's eligible to appeal, um, how do medical expenses work into this? Because we know that families frequently face unexpected medical expenses or high medical expenses and and is that even appealable? It absolutely is uh, with the, the usual caveat that different schools may look at it a little bit differently um, but most I think in general will be happy to take into consideration uh, some unusual or especially high medical expenses that a family is incurring. Um, one important point to make is that what they're always going to be looking for is not just a total of your medical expense, but whatever medical expenses were not covered, say by insurance or otherwise uh, paid for for the family. So really just looking at unreimbursed medical expenses. Uh, some schools will only consider them if they exceed a certain percentage of the total income, for example. Uh, like say, some schools might say, we will look at medical expenses if they exceeded 5% of your income. Um, we do something kind of similar to that. I have also worked with schools who will consider medical expenses unreimbursed, uh, but then will cap to what extent they will consider them. So they might consider up to, say, $5,000 of expenses. Um, a very important piece, though, is that generally schools will want to see some kind of documentation uh, of those expenses, whether it's bills, uh, the explanation of benefits forms that you get from your insurance company when they've paid off or paid part of a medical bill, things like that. Okay. Uh, Miranda, anything from the VSAC perspective you'd like to add? Sure. Uh, so from the VSAC perspective related to medical expenses, the um, expenses need to, as Zach said, be paid out of pocket. Um, so not covered by insurance and not just incurred, so just not accumulated, they have to have been paid. Um, so, and we can look at two different years for this. So 2018, um, we, can, we'll, we can look at medical expenses that were paid out of pocket in 2018. But just to give a little bit of an example of what I was talking about, if you had you know, some medical expenses come up in December of 2018, but you didn't actually pay them until 2019, we would not be able to consider those. Um, so the expenses have to be paid either in 2018 or with 2020, we can look at the medical expenses that you expect to pay out of pocket in 2020 if we use your estimated 2020 income. So we're trying to tie your expenses to the, your income. So 2018 expenses and income, 2020 income um, and expenses. And for medical expenses, VSAC can consider things like insurance premiums you paid, dental expenses, medical, doctor's appointments, prescriptions, um, even travel potentially. So we could, um, you know, if you needed to travel out of state for a special procedure, we could potentially take that into consideration. And for VSAC, medic medical expenses need to be 5% or more of your total income before they'll begin to be considered as an unusual expense. But again, we're not expecting you to do the math, so you can let us know what your medical expenses were, and we will let you know if they will have an impact on the Vermont grant. Perfect, thank you, Miranda. So um, we have a question here that says, what if our income hasn't changed significantly, but we have had medical expenses about $10,000 and unexpected urgent house repairs, a family 
septic system. Can those things be taken into consideration? Miranda, can you start with that one? Sure. Um, so depending on when the medical expenses were that, and when you paid them, we can potentially consider them. So if they're recent and you expect to pay them in 2020, we would still have you complete the estimated income worksheet, even though your income hasn't changed, but just so that we could align your expenses with your income. Um, and the unexpected house repair, the, the failed septic system, we ask, send that to us in writing. And I, we usually can take that into consideration for the Vermont grant. Um, and again, we will have to, you know, know, ask probably more questions about, you know, how did you, is it, has it been paid for? Did you use your savings? How, where did that, how was that expense covered? Um, but yeah, let us know about that. I'm assuming you'd have to know how much they paid to fix it, those types of things? Correct. Perfect. Zach, what about at St. Mike's? What would you guys do with that question? Uh, specifically at St. Mike's? I'm kidding, of course. Uh, <laughs> Really, you're going to get so sick of my well, maybe, and if, and uh, if you don't mind me jumping back just slightly, because Miranda made a very important point about the timing of medical expenses. Um, that is a very common approach, which she's described for VSAC purposes, that we want to be looking at income and expenses from the same time period to make a decision. But I also wanted to throw out there that if maybe you haven't had a significant income change, so what you see in 2018 on your FAFSA form is still pretty accurate now, but today you're incurring these significant medical expenses. There is a little bit of flexibility when it comes to federal financial aid and school financial aid that will be largely at their discretion. And sometimes we can look at income from a couple of years ago and medical expenses from right now. So Again, what you might see from VSAC, don't let that necessarily guide what you do other places because they will have their own uh, approach there. But moving on to, <laughs> to the second part of the question, uh, of course it depends. And generally I'd say it depends most likely on whether they have taken into consideration your home at all. So for instance, for some schools, they will look at the equity in your house as an asset that you have, and that may contribute to the kind of institutional grants that you're eligible to receive. It doesn't play into the federal part, but it might play into the school's grants. So if you're, say, borrowing money to make these urgent repairs, that would actually reduce the equity in your home. It would be less of an asset to you, and the school might be able to consider that for your own funds. Uh, schools do still have some discretion with that when it comes to federal financial aid, but the federal form does not take into account uh, any uh, real estate that is your primary residence. Uh, so I would never say never, always ask, and you'll hear us reinforce that a lot today, always ask, it will never hurt to ask, um, but it is probably more common for federal financial aid not to take repairs into consideration. Great. Okay, well, I'm going to move us on to the final category tonight, and then we do have a lot of questions that have come in that I want to make sure we have time to answer. So this one is a little complex, so bear with me, and, and Miranda and Zach, if you need to ask questions about who the players are, I can, I can always recap. So the Smiths have two children. Their youngest child, Sam, just turned 18 and has been accepted to college and will be starting in the fall. They also have an adult daughter who is a single mom with a one-year-old daughter of her own. The adult daughter is an essential worker at a local grocery store where she's working an extended night shift. In mid-March, the daughter moved home along with her child so that Mr. and Mrs. Smith could help her with child care while she worked. While the Smiths are very happy to have their daughter and granddaughter with them, they're finding it is much more expensive to have five of them at home rather than the three they were expecting. Can they appeal their family size? Miranda, you wanna start with that and tell me if I confused you. I think I followed you, Marilyn. Uh, so it's a great question and uh, probably one that we'll hear uh, this spring uh, or the summer. Um, and the answer is maybe. So it's, 
this is one of the scenarios we w where we at VSAC um, would likely follow up for more information to help us understand your situation um, before we could decide if we could consider the additional family members as part of your family size or and consider this as an appeal. Uh, so when families complete the FAFSA, the family size at the time that they were filling it out was should include everyone in the household for whom the parents would provide more than half support through the upcoming school year. So between July 1st, 2020 and June 30th, 2021. Um, so keeping that in mind, that more than half support is really what we're going to be looking for when we're asking some more probing questions about what kind of support, um, what is, is the, the older daughter paying rent, um, or are you, are you just covering for her, her, the food, how much support are you providing to the child, because she is still working. So it's those type of things where we'll need a little bit more information. Great. Zach, what about, what are you thinking? I, I think I don't need to add anything to what Miranda said, uh, especially when we're talking about federal financial aid. Um, certainly the student is always included in the household, the parents would be in the household, and under most circumstances, believe it or not, the sibling could also be considered in the household, but especially with the, the young child, the baby, uh, we'd be certainly con concerned about whether the parents were actually providing more than half of that younger child's support. Uh, so yeah, I would expect to be asked about some documentation to show that. And so. And I'm sorry if, if you just said that, but would you be asking the family whether or not the daughter was paying rent or whether she was helping out with utilities or buying her own food? Are those the kinds of questions you'd be asking her about, Zach? Possibly, especially when it comes to college financial aid for the institution's own funds. Uh, again, federal, federal regulation will allow to an extent for an, a sibling to be counted as a member of the household. Um, but often still that support test will come in and if that has to be asked about uh, they probably would want to know if the daughter since she's still working is going to be contributing more than half of her own support perfect thank you so i'm going to go back i've got a questions that have come in before this presentation and questions that are coming in right now that i want to make sure we get to so uh this one's interesting they all have them but this one is from a graduate student Hi, I'm wondering how much student income plays a role in determining grant awards. My parents' financial situation has not changed, but I've left my job prior to starting graduate school and I will not have time to work while attending college. Would my change in income be cause for appeal? Zach, do you wanna grab that one from a grad student? Like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I might speak just very briefly since you're going to be a graduate student, uh, unless your school is asking for their own purposes to have your parental financial information included, at least in terms of federal financial aid, it is not at all required. It's going to be based entirely on your individual financial situation. But that's actually a very common issue to come up in grad school. Schedules can be very demanding. It's just not feasible to be trying to work part-time or full-time while you're going to school. Um, so I can almost promise you that your school has probably encountered this before. Um, so do please reach out to them. I think they would probably be happy to try to help. And I think probably, Zach, it's worth mentioning because she's specifically asking about grant awards, that there are certain grants, like. For example, the Vermont State Grant, the Pell Grant, that are not available right now to most graduate students. So it would be school grants that we would be talking about, not federal or state grants, and it would probably be um, her ability to get subsidized loans. Those would be the types of things that her appeal would probably impact. Um. I was sort of thinking of it as from the institutional grant perspective, since it's uh, yeah. at least exactly what you said, and that's a very important clarification. Um, but I have to add a piece of worse news <laughs> to what you said as a graduate student that as of a few years ago, 
even subsidized student loans are not. Right, right. So the only federal aid available will be unsubsidized loans and then the PLUS loan. Right, thank you, Zach, for correcting okay. that. Um, so here's our next question, and I'm gonna just keep running them as long as they're coming in. We were hoping to use some funds from refinancing our home to help pay for college, but it's not finished enough to refinance. We don't owe a lot, but can't get to that equity. Do we need to get a bank inspection to prove this? Miranda, do you want to take the first question? <laughs> that, that question is so complex, isn't it? It is. So for the Vermont grant program, we do take into consideration the equity that you have in your home when determining this, the student's Vermont grant eligibility. Um, so I can't really speak to you know, the bank inspect inspection to, as far as being able to refinance, but once you are able to refinance and you borrow those funds, you can let us know about the increase in your the debt that you owe on your home and that may or may not be enough of a change to impact the student's grant eligibility do you think that answers sure that? zach do you want to add anything to that uh, only only one side note um because that's we're again right on the same page as always miranda <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> that, and this is a, a tricky thing sometimes in the financial aid world, that it's just important to note that if someone, if a school uh, is looking at the kind of equity that you have in your home and considering that an asset, that there is never a direct expectation that the school is thinking you need to go out and borrow against your home. Uh, they're often looking at what they might call overall financial strengths of your family. So, in theory, owning a home puts you in a stronger financial situation than if you are renting. And so that might contribute to your eligibility, but there's never a direct correlation. Similarly, if you complete the FAFSA and you see your expected family contribution, that never will correlate directly to what anyone actually expects you to pay. <laughs> it's a very misleading term. Okay, here's another question. Miranda, I think this really is, is aimed towards you in the advancement grant. Okay. Um, I understand that students in certificate programs are not eligible for federal grants. How would an appeal help in that case? Good question. So the, my first, the first thing that I would recommend is just to verify with your college that your certificate program is not eligible for federal financial aid. So, uh, some may be, but if it is not, and it is considered a non-degree type program not eligible for federal financial aid, the Vermont VSAC has an advancement grant that's available um, to students. And we are using the same income information that we would for our degree grants when determ determining advancement grant eligibility. So we would be looking for 2018 income, and if that is not accurate anymore um, and you've had a change and your 2020 income is less, we would have you complete the same estimated income worksheet um, that we talked about a little bit earlier tonight. So you definitely should, you know, if you're applying for the advancement grant, which the application for the upcoming school year is available now for classes that start after July 1st, um, we're going to ask for a copy of your 2018 tax return when you send that in to us let us know that your income has changed and we can post that worksheet for you. Perfect. So here's a question um, that was sent to us earlier um, and she had listed a few different uh, changes that are occurring, some of which we've already talked about. And she says, my daughter will be bringing all of this up in her request for more financial aid. Will we also have to appeal for next year's aid and the years after aid because our situation keeps changing or or does she just have to tell you this once? Zach, do you want to take the first swing at that? Sure, and uh, unfortunately for better or worse, uh, financial aid appeals will almost always simply be for the year in question. Uh, so schools will be looking year after year at what your overall financial situation looks like. And if it continues to 
be not well represented on your financial aid application on your FAFSA, an appeal would still be beneficial in succeeding. Miranda, anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, I think just like you have to, every financial aid year, you have to apply for financial, or every school year, you have to apply for financial aid again, um, because it's looking, we're looking for different income, um, you know, different assets, you may have a different family size. So just keep reminding us what your situation is and um, what's changed. Okay, so perfect, thank you. Here's another question that just came in. My husband and I are partners in a small business in Vermont. We had to lay off staff and close our office during the Vermont stay at home order. Accordingly, we've had a reduction in income since March. We are in a high risk category for COVID-19, so we are trying to work from home and only allowing one staff person in the office at a time and no clients. Because we are self-employed, we have no idea what our income will be at the end of this year. Do we have a basis to appeal financial aid? Who would like to start with that one? I'm happy to start, Marilyn. Thank you. Um, first, I'll start by saying different schools will handle it different. <laughs> um, but absolutely, absolutely there is a basis. I know just inherent with any self-employment is an unpredictability and where your income is going to fall in any given year. Um, but particularly now, you know, we're in June, so the year is essentially halfway done, and you've got a pretty decent picture of what's happened so far. Um, so I would definitely recommend that you bring it up with your schools and probably VSAC too. Yes, VSAC too. Um, we are going to look for you, you to provide your best estimate on what you think your income is going to be for 2020. So like Zach said, you, half of the year is over. Um, if hopefully things stay as they have, you know, if things are getting better the last month or two, maybe you could use that to estimate towards the end of the year. Really your, what you think your income is going to be for the year is what we'll, we will be looking for um, you to provide on that worksheet. So here's an interesting question as well. Is the only factor calculation of need or is grant money availability an issue? Is the anecdotal aspect of the appeal important, particularly rel relative to other appeals? So for example, would COVID hardships be getting preferential treatment over other hardships? So I'm gonna take the first swing at that and then I'm gonna turn it over to you. In this particular case, because the legislature has actually appropriated some of the COVID funding to address COVID issues, there are circumstances where COVID situations will be looked at um, regardless of whether there's still uh, general funds available. But usually, and VSAC has been doing this for all of the 35 years I've been working there, we are able to consider estimated income appeals, changes in uh, family size, and all of those things throughout the entire fall and usually a little bit even into the spring. So I don't think it's really a, a matter of the uh, COVID being more important by any means. I just think we as a state are recognizing that COVID may be hitting families especially hard, but Anybody can appeal. It does not have to be COVID related. It could be that you lost your job because your business is moving to another state. That is a perfectly fine appeal. Um, and VSAC would look at that with the same intensity that we would look at any other appeal that we receive. Uh, Zach or Miranda, would you like to add a little more to that response? I might just throw something out about the federal financial aid and institutional financial aid piece. Again, uh, mostly to stress that with very few exceptions, federal financial aid, like the federal Pell Grant or student loans are entitlements. Uh, so they are strictly basing your eligibility for those types of aid on financial need based on what's in the FAFSA or an estimate or something else if there's been a change in circumstances. 
if your EFC is a certain level or your overall financial aid need is a certain level, you will qualify for those funds. So there's no, there's no limitation to you. Um, with some exceptions, like with the Pell Grant, you can only receive six years worth, for example. Uh, but generally, you're going to get it if you qualify, hands down. Um, with institutional funding, it is certainly possible, depending on uh, how the school has structured their financial aid programs, that there might be sort of an end to the pot of money for certain types of grants. And once they've given it out, they've given it out. Uh, that is part of the reason, too, why a lot of schools will always encourage applying as early as possible uh, for those grants. So that's possible. That could happen. But that's generally just going to be with, with a school's financial aid program. Miranda, did you want to add anything or were you all set with that? No, I think your answer was great. Okay, thank you. So here's another one. I am in my 30s and returning to school this fall after being laid off from my job due to COVID. As I will be paying for this out of my own pocket, should I appeal my financial aid since my income is significantly less than in 2018? Yes. Miranda, you want to grab that one? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, because your income is significantly different um, from 2018, then yes, you should appeal. Um, if you're going to be in an undergraduate, enrolling in an undergraduate program and have applied for the Vermont grant, let us know and let your financial aid office, or if you're applying to multiple financial aid offices and still in looking for admission, um, let all of them know. Zach, are you good with that one? I am, I, I lost audio for just a brief moment. Um, did this questioner say whether it was an undergraduate program or a graduate program? No. No, no that's fine. Then I will just say something about graduate programs. <laughs> <laughs> you covered undergrad very well. Um, just to say, by all means, check with your school as to what types of aid might be available for their graduate programs. The, the sad truth often is with grant programs, even at the their grad programs, a lot of schools don't have their own funds for those programs. Um, if you're just going to be stuck with federal student loans anyway to help get you through school, appealing is not actually going to probably help uh, unless there are some additional costs. And even then, it would be a matter of being able to borrow a little more. Okay. So, say, I don't want you to invest a lot of time if it's not actually going to, to change something for you. Good advice, Zach. So this one, um, I was laid off due to COVID-19 and am collecting unemployment assistance. How would I address that on an appeal? Would the unemployment funds be considered as income? Zach, do you want to start with that one? Sure, I'll start with the magic, it depends. <laughs> uh, because different schools, again, will always treat it differently, but also there's even some discretion in terms of federal student aid, in terms of whether that unemployment income is considered to be income. Uh, for IRS purposes, yes, it's taxable income, uh, but when you are requesting additional funds, some schools may actually choose to ignore that unemployment income and essentially just you know, treat it as if it doesn't exist. Some schools may choose to consider it as part of your overall income, but it's still very worthwhile to go through the appeal process because of course unemployment is only paying you a small portion of what you would have been earning normally, at least in most cases. Okay. Miranda, does that cover your answer or would you like to add anything? Um, BSEC will consider the unemployment um, funds as income, but as Zach said, um, because it's usually a, a lower amount than what, you, what you're typically earning. Um, and with the pandemic unemployment insistence, I believe that ends after a certain amount of time as well. So, um, and if you continue to be laid off, then I, I, your 2020 income will likely be less than what it was in 2018. Um, but when you complete our estimated income worksheet, you will see a question for unemployment and, um, benefits to be reported. All right, here is another question. Um, I am an incoming medical student and due to COVID-19, not only has my income been reduced, but my savings have been destroyed. I planned on using those savings for school costs. Could this be the basis for appealing? Thanks. Miranda, do you wanna start with that one? Um, sure. So for the Vermont grant, 
the change in your assets uh, is something that we would be able to take into consideration. Um, there is in the financial aid calculation a little bit of protection uh, that comes um, with, with assets. It's not much, but it's a little bit. So depending on, you know, what we're talking about for asset values, it may or may not have an impact on your Vermont grant award, but it's definitely something worth, you know, sending to us. Um, you can send us an email and we will either, you know, with the value of what's, what's was on your FAFSA and what the value is now, um, or we may ask you to complete a, an asset worksheet to, to gather that information. But the fact that their income has gone down, we definitely could look at that. Yes. Right. Okay. Yep. Zach, do you want to add anything? Uh, only the <laughs> failure of just the bearer of bad news today about graduate education. Um, certainly for VSAC, and if the institution uh, is offering grant funding at this particular medical school, I would definitely encourage you to raise it. If this is another kind of situation where you're likely just going to be relying on loans, the fact that your income changed may not have any impact at all on um, how much or whether you can borrow. Thank you, Zach. Being a grad student is hard. <laughs> Um, so I've got a couple more here that I'd like to hand off. So what if the family income drops because father is now only receiving SDD instead of insurance disability, which was not taxable. We inherited a, inherited a house, which is a financial burden. This is the first year we have received nothing. Our AGI is under 85,000. We have one undergrad who's a senior and one grad student. Should we stop claim, claiming the undergrad? So again, that question is way, way more complex than it seems on the surface. Um, do you think that, do you want me to read it again or did you get that one? I guess my question would be in terms of claiming, do they mean claiming on a financial aid appeal, for example, or are they talking about taxes or do we know? I don't think we know, but I, I read it to, that they were questioning whether they should continue to claim the undergrad on their tax return. Let's assume that's the question, Zach, and, and answer that one. And then uh, we can talk about whether they should appeal this or not. Uh, I'm not totally convinced I'm qualified to answer that question <laughs> only because federal financial aid rules in terms of who counts as a dependent are actually more generous than IRS rules. Um, but if the student meets definition of a qualifying dependent by the IRS code, then they can certainly continue to claim them, um, which can increase exemption levels and might reduce overall tax what if it's in the other direction? What if the question is, should I stop claiming my students so that you don't count my income? That's an interesting question. Uh, because whether they claim the student or not doesn't really change whether you need parental information, does it? No, if the student is a dependent student, by the federal, by federal student aid standards, <laughs> those yes. be parental information regardless of who claims or if they claim. Oh, maybe that was what they were getting at, Marilyn. Yes, I think that might have been what they were getting at. I think you're right, yes. So if we assume that whether or not they claim the student won't really matter, um, then I think the question it comes back to, their income's gone down, so that is appealable. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they inherited a house that is a financial burden, is that one of those places where you're going to need more information before you could decide whether or not there's something appealable in that part of what they're describing? Wait, Miranda? Wait. Oh, I'm sorry, Miranda. Nope. Uh, yes, I think we would need more information about how is it a financial burden? What expenses are, are they uh, experiencing because they've inherited the house? Um, it is considered, you know, the FAFSA, the financial aid forms do ask for other real estate. So it's, you know, I know it does have to be reported on, on the FAFSA, 
Um, so I would encourage this family to write us or email us, give us a call to, to talk about what, what's, what's related to that house and what are the you know, expenses that they're experiencing. Perfect, thank you. Um, and they did write to us and say, yes, that was the question. And then they wanted to talk about the inherited house. So thank you. Uh, Zach, I think you mentioned that you would answer this one. I am a Vermont resident and I'm starting the master's program at Goddard and I was awarded 3,500, but now I'm told that I'm not able to receive the grant. With the current COVID situation, I don't know if I'll be able to start this program. I did say I wanted to answer that, but I actually wanted to answer that with a question in the hope that Rusty is still here with us. Uh, I was really curious what type of grant you were receiving, whether that was from, from Goddard or from some other kind of program. Uh, and also to stress too, since this is a master's program, I'm thrilled that you were able to get some grant funds. Um, and I'm sad that maybe now you can't retain them, but that you would still have student loans available to you as a grad student also. So it wouldn't necessarily mean that you wouldn't have access to resources to uh, cover your educational costs there. They just might not be as nice as having grant funds. But I was still curious what kind of grant fund it was. Okay, I will let you know if he comes back in. <laughs> um, Ma uh, Miranda, did you want to add anything or should I go on to our next question? I think you can go on to the next question. We'll see what comes back. Perfect. So Miranda, I'm going to have you start with this one. Okay. Um, I was working during school undergrad last year and was laid off in March due to COVID. And my summer camp job was also canceled. Is this something I can appeal? Yes, if in your 2020 income is going to be less than your 2018 income. So it sounds like definitely your 2020 income is going to be less than what it was last year because you were working. Um, but we're going all the way back on the financial aid forms to 2018. So that's really the comparison. Um, but again, if you know, if you're not sure what you earned in 2018, we know from your financial aid applications that you can always give us a call and we can, we can take a look and talk it through with you. Perfect. Zach, anything to add to that one? No, that was perfect. This has actually been an appeal that personally I have seen from a lot of families because students are working and trying to save up over the summer to contribute to their college costs and now a lot of those jobs just don't exist now. Got it. Okay, so I've got two more I'm going to try to get us through in the next couple of minutes and then I'm going to try to see if I'm missing any. And I, if we didn't get to your question tonight, I do apologize. So uh, the question is, during the virus, I got stuck in an area with poor Wi-Fi. It is impossible to do my work and I'm getting behind in my classes. Because of COVID, I cannot upgrade my current internet services and have to drive three hours round trip to town and back to be able to do some schoolwork. I now, however, have found an apartment in town where I can set up Comcast and be able to do my schooling. However, like many, my resources are low due to the virus. Is there any help I can get for moving costs or deposit assistance? That's a great question. It's a very good uh, question. <laughs> for, I think it's worth asking your financial aid offices or at least VSAC um, with the, the COVID relief funds that VSAC may be receiving, there may be something in there that we could consider um, as, a, as an expense related to, related to this. Um, I don't know for sure. And the challenge will be the grants are not dispersed until classes start for the fall. So at that point, it may be too late um, to help you with anything. That's Vermont grant wise. So I would say send that to us in an email or a letter. We're trying to track what we're hearing for special circumstances related to COVID and um, we'll let you know if it's something we could consider. And you know, be specific in the the you know what your expenses are 
um, as much detail as you can provide. Zach, is there anything you'd like to add to that? I might just throw out there, um, if, if you're familiar with the CARES Act, I'm sorry, I'm not going to remember what the acronym stands for exactly, but um, many educational institutions do have funding that receive funding from the Department of Education specifically to provide emergency grants. It's very similar to what the state is doing uh, with VSAC to help students in Vermont. Um, it is probably worth checking with them to see if there is any of that funding available that they might be able to access. This is exactly why that funding is there to deal with things like technology needs, transportation, all of those kinds of things where, where you've been impacted because of the pandemic. Um, with some federal funds, schools have also been given flexibility about providing some emergency grants. Um, so certainly, as Miranda said, by all means ask, the funding might be there. So I'm gonna to try to squeeze in, I've still got two more left. Um, I, let's see here. We have submitted a financial aid appeal with our daughter's college and they indicate that they need our 2019 tax return to consider the appeal. 2019 tax returns are not due until July 15. And moreover, we have filed for a six month extension. So the return is not due until October 15 and may not be complete until then. What should we do? Ask if they'll accept something else. <laughs> I say that tongue in cheek, but if, um, depending on how you're earning your income, if you're mostly earning your W-2 wages over the course of the year, you would already have access to those forms uh, to demonstrate your income. They may be able to accept some alternatives to that. If that's the school's policy, they may not be willing to make an exception, but but again, I can't hurt to ask them. Okay. Um, and this is the last question I think we're gonna get in tonight, but we are gonna share information in just a moment that we'll have contact information for Miranda, for the Vermont State Grant Department and for SAC. And you're welcome to send questions directly to any of those contacts. Uh, but the last one is, if I appeal and the new award is less than the previous award, are we allowed to keep the old award from BSAC instead of the appealed one? Miranda, can you answer that? Oh, what? You, yes. <laughs> the, uh, as long as you're not providing us any new information that wasn't originally provided on the financial aid application, um, other than the special circumstance, then the new award should not be any less than the previous award. So, so for me to bring that back, if somebody's 2020 income actually is higher than their 2018, we're going to ignore it. We're correct. not going to use the 20. We won't use the 20. So yes, if it's specific to the to estimated income, yeah, we'll use whatever's best for the family. Great. And I think that's probably a, a wonderful spot for us to end on. Miranda and Zach, thank you so much for giving us your time this evening and letting us hear your expertise. Uh, this event has been recorded and it will be made available on the VSAC website and we'll get information out, I'm sorry, on the uh, VSAC Facebook page, we'll get information out on how people can reach that. Uh, I really appreciate everyone who has joined us this evening and thank you again and hopefully everyone can see the contact information that is now up on the screen, but grants at vsac.org. You can send any question to us. A Z Goodwin at SMC, St. Michael's College, vt.edu. And then we're also providing a toll free number for VSAC, which is 800 882 4166. Thank you and good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.